Experiences Session 12, Track B. Uh, the first presentation is going to be Virtual Animals as Diegetic Attention Guidance Mechanisms and 360 Degree Experiences. And this is going to be presented by Nahal Naruzi, who is a computer science PhD candidate at the University of Central Florida and a graduate research assistant in the Synthetic Reality uh, Lab. Her research interests include augmented and virtual reality, virtual animals and humans, and augmented and enhanced perception. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Poles, for the kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, so I'm very, OK, I think it's working. So I'm very happy to uh, share our project with you on behalf of my uh, co-authors, Dr. Gerd Bruder, Austin Erickson, uh, Kang Soo Kim, and uh, Dr. Jeremy Bailison, Dr. Pamela Wisniewski, Dr. Charlie Hughes, and Dr. Greg Welch. So uh, our project in this work uh, has uh, the overarching theme is basically the potential benefits of virtual animals as diegetic acknowledging attention guidance mechanisms in 360 VR. And there are three main points here. The first is attention guidance mechanisms in 360 VR. Next one is virtual animals as diegetic entities. And the last one is the acknowledging behaviors of these entities. So starting with the first point, one question that arises is why guide users' attention in 360 VR? Uh, so let's imagine that we have this uh, VR HMD user. And of course, with current technology, the field of view of the user is limited. Uh, but irrespective of technology limitations, uh, we know that as humans, our attention is limited. Uh, so if this user is immersed in this uh, virtual environment, let's say they're watching a 360 video, and uh, one of the beauties of 360 VR experiences is that users have a lot of freedom compared to, for instance, watching a movie in the cinema. So they can explore at will and free freely look around, basically. But this added freedom can have some negative, uh, negative uh, things added to the experience. As an example, if this user uh, you know, starts exploring and is looking to another direction, they might miss the event of the chicken hatching right in front of them. And some previous research in 360 VR experiences have found that sometimes when users miss events, they experience a confusion or what researchers are now calling fear of missing out. So if the experience calls for some a level of attention guidance, one question here is how are we going to go about this task? And this is not uh, a new question. So researchers have been trying to find good answers for this question for years, not just in this area, but in other domains. As an example, in the area of redirected walking, researchers have been using distractors, for instance, visual or auditory, to kind of like grab users' attention while they're reorienting the world around the user. So basically what we want is to have some sort of element, let's say this graphical arrow here, to guide the user's attention back in time for them to see the event and not experience any fear or confusion. And uh, over the years, there has been many different ways to characterize all the different attention guidance mechanisms. And in our work, uh, we mainly refer back to the taxonomy by uh, Ota et al. And we also mainly uh, focus on the notion of diegesis, which brings us back to our overarching theme. And the second question that comes up is, uh, what do we mean by diegesis? Uh, so here on this slide, you can see a bunch of examples from previous work uh, of diegetic and non-diegetic cues. So starting with diegetic cues, to put it simply, any cue or element that is used for attention guidance that belongs to the environment or the story and is inherent there is considered to be diegetic. So for instance, in the top figure, if you use the sound of the kettle or the clock to guide users' attention, uh, then that would be considered diegetic. Or in the examples on the bottom, uh, you know, in the past people used uh, characters' gestures or characters' motions to guide users' attention. Contrary to that, would be non-diegetic cues that are external to the environment or the story or don't necessarily belong to the environment or story, such as uh, peripheral flashes or using graphical arrows. And uh, uh, here we have uh, two of uh, Ko et al's uh, diegetic and non-diegetic cues as exemplars, which were presented at ESMA last year. And you know, previous research uh, has found that the choice of mechanism has a wide range of influences on users' experience, such as influencing their sense of presence, uh, the cue noticeability, 
level of enjoyment of users and many other factors. So in this work, we saw the opportunity to kind of like dig deeper on the impact of virtual animals from the point of view of many of these potential influences. And going back to our over overarching theme one last time, focusing on the acknowledging part, the question here is what do we mean by acknowledging? So let's imagine that uh, there are two people in this room and then we are the third person that you know, entered that space. So we are the guy in the green uh, uh, overalls. And uh, if the two people that were already there turn towards us, start talking to us and acknowledge our presence, uh, you know, those acknowledging behaviors can change how we feel about that interaction and uh, with those people. So we might feel more included or more relevant. And although there is not a ton of research here in terms of acknowledging behaviors in 360 VR experiences, the ones that are out there have found positive benefits for these acknowledging behaviors in terms of users feeling more present, feeling more engaged and feeling more connected. So here we saw the opportunity to uh, kind of like have a dual purpose entity, one that both acknowledges the users and also acts as an attention guidance mechanism. Uh, based on all these opportunities, we wanted to broadly answer two research questions. First, we wanted to understand the impact of virtual animals as diegetic attention guidance mechanisms. And next, we wanted to kind of like understand what happens when we add acknowledging behaviors to these uh, virtual animals. So to answer these research questions, we conducted a human subjects user study. Uh, to give you an overview of our study, uh, it was a within, sub within subjects design it had five conditions. We had 28 participants and we adopted a variety of objective and subjective measures and uh, also adopted a mixed methods analysis. So in this study, the participants were always seated. Uh, they were free to, uh, to explore, so they were not forced to follow anything if they didn't want to. And, uh, but this exploration was only limited to them rotating their head or rotating on the chair. So they could not physically or virtually translate in the virtual urban environment that they were immersed in. And for each condition, uh, we had five uh, target events that were randomly uh, placed uh, at plus minus 20 degrees behind the participants. There was a no guidance condition and uh, there were four attention guidance mechanisms condition, which were all randomized. So talking a little more about the target events, we had five different categories of target events and five examples within each category. So we had 25 events in total. And for each condition, uh, we randomly assigned one example of each category. Uh, so one example of group of people dancing, one example of children playing, for instance. And uh, moving to our conditions, uh, here you can see four of our five conditions. So uh, on the left, that's the baseline condition where there was no guidance. And the three on the right are all of our non-acknowledging conditions. So the non-diegetic arrow, the diegetic bird, and diegetic dog. And the reason we call them non-acknowledging was that they had nothing to do with the participants or the environment. So basically they just appeared in the user's field of view and then guided the user and disappeared gradually after a few seconds. And uh, Contrary to these uh, non-acknowledging mechanisms was our acknowledging uh, diegetic dog condition. So the difference was that this, this mechanism had a wide range of behaviors to exhibit both acknowledgement of the user and the environment. So for instance, it was always present with the user with some plausible idle behavior. It uh, sniffed the ground while it was kind of like uh, starting the guidance phase and looked back towards user's orientation. It acknowledged the event by looking at it and attending to it and then came back to the users when the event phase was over. Uh, here, I want to share a few examples of our findings uh, to see the differences between all of these conditions. Uh, starting with our objective measures, uh, I want to focus on the event start uh, measure that is highlighted. So event start represents the percentage of times that participants got to see the starting moment uh, of an event. I remember that events were always randomly placed somewhere behind them. Uh, and uh, we found that the addition, basically all of our attention guidance mechanisms, regardless of being diegetic or not, were effective in guiding uh, the users to the target events compared to not having a guide at all. Uh, focusing on some of our subjective measures and looking at the behavioral influence subscale, uh, this is from a questionnaire that we devised ourselves. And behavioral influence represents how uh, forced and how rushed participants felt 
uh, given a specific attention guidance mechanism. And we found that participants perceive the diegetic mechanisms, which represents all the virtual animals, as less rushing and less forcing compared to the non-diegetic mechanisms. Uh, for looking at another uh, one of our subjective measures, we have several uh, uh, preference, uh, uh, preference subscales. And for instance, focusing on comfortable, how comfortable participants were working with a mechanism, we found that uh, participants were more comfortable uh, having and working with the acknowledging dog. And we see the similar pattern with the other, uh, other uh, preference uh, rankings that we have. And the last finding that I want to share with you is our uh, the thematic analysis from our post-study interview. So uh, we found three themes from this uh, analysis. The first one was participants iterated many times that blending in with the environment matters. So they mentioned, for instance, anytime something didn't blend in, uh, it was pulling them out of the experience or they said things like, oh, we felt like it was a simulation or it was fake. The next theme uh, that we found was acknowledgement led to a more positive experience. So interestingly, the fact that they were being acknowledged actually reinforced the fact that participants were present in that environment. And some of our participants saw the acknowledging diegetic dog as some sort of a companion in the whole experience that they were having. And the last point, uh, the last thing that we found was that positive associations with the guide matters. So uh, participants mentioned that Finding the guides to be elegant or cute or comforting, all those factors actually factored in to them preferring those uh, attention guidance mechanisms more. So a few take home messages, going back to our research questions. First research question is that virtual animals, in response to that, virtual animals actually can be effective diegetic attention guidance mechanisms. And in, these days, actually, the whole notion of diegesis is, uh, is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, seen in many other papers compared to, to the, the past. So, uh, and it's very interesting that other domains are looking at it within the whole field of AR and VR. So before, with redirected walking, researchers were kind of like looking at this concept, but not necessarily using this term. But more and more, we are seeing, for instance, for user interfaces, work by Dickinson et al. that was presented at IGT VR, or uh, Godsacker et al. that was presented recently in ISMAR 2021. Uh, so it's an interesting notion that can be studied and utilized in different domains. And uh, last, uh, in response to our last research question, we found that acknowledging behaviors actually reinforced participants' sense of place and plausibility illusion and uh, led to higher preference in general, even over not having anything, uh, which is which, because we thought that having adding something would be disruptive, but we found that it was actually preferred more. Uh, thank you so much for paying attention uh, to our talk and we have videos of everything. So if you uh, want to see videos, please reach out and uh, we would be happy to hear your thoughts and questions. All right, thanks. Uh, one, one quick question uh, from, I have one quick question. Yes. Do you think that the color or the size of the dog or the bird or the arrow made any kind of difference in terms of I mean, obviously the acknowledging part was really the big, you know, that was kind of the, the message, right? But do you think that the appearance or like the, the color or size of any of these kind of things made a difference in terms of them being able to be effective guidance mechanisms? Uh, that is uh, that is very interesting. We did not vary any of, any of those things. So for instance, for the bird or for a dog, we actually tried to stick to the natural size of that entity. So it is not something that we studied but it didn't necessarily come up in our interview responses. Mm. Uh, one thing that came up, which is not necessarily answered to your question, was where they were placed. So if it was in their line of sight, sometimes people were annoyed because it was very distracting, while they preferred that they could still see the dog, but if they wanted to, they could ignore it. Gotcha. Uh, so that was something that came up. Yeah, cool, all right, thanks. Thank you. All right, let's move on to our next paper. Uh, which is measuring the perceived three-dimensional location of virtual objects and optical see-through augmented reality. And this is going to be presented by Far
Maybe you should just start talking, Arjun. Okay. Uh, should I share my screen now? I think so, yeah. Okay. Right, um, you all can see my screen here? Yes. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Farzana Alam Khan. I'm a master's student from Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Mississippi State University. And today my presented paper is measuring the perceived three-dimensional location of virtual objects in optical see-through augmented reality. So here are all the authors you can see, like after me, there is Krishna Muva, Jamie Su, Muhammad Shafaid Arafin, Ned Phillips, and J. Edward Swan. So in augmented reality, uh, users see that the virtual object is superimposed in the real world. But the question is where in the real world the virtual object is located. So this is a locational realism problem. And uh, this is important for many of the air applications like sports broadcasting, medical issues, etc. So we have developed, uh, for, for answering the question, we have developed a measurement method for measuring the, for the optical see-through air displays. So for measuring the perceptual location of the uh, object, of the object, there are existing two methods. One is the OST air calibration method which seeks to measure the position of the user size within an OST air display. And the second one is, the, um, is, use, is using the egocentric depth between the user and the virtual object. So for our work, we are adopting the calibration method of Kenny Moser for measuring the perceptual location of the virtual object. So here are our main goals. Uh, our main goal is to develop and demonstrate a method for measuring the perceived 3D location of the air presented virtual object. So that means it will not only give the information of depth, that means not only the Z dimension, but it will also give the information about the X dimension and the Y dimension. Our next goal is to evaluate the quality of the virtual object location and testing the hollowness tracking stability across movement and multiple displays. And for our work, we are using a Microsoft first generation HoloLens display. So here is our experimental task. So basically we have two tasks. Our primary task is verbalizing the grid coordinate. So here in the first picture, you can see that an, uh, a participant is standing in front of an experimental table. So, and in this table, there is a horizontal plane and the vertical plane that is mounted together and the grid is overlaid on top of that. So this grid is about 22 by 22 and each of the grid cell is about 1.95 by 1.95 centimeter. We have used three different fiducials here. So the colorful one is the Vifuria marker and the grids also are another kind of fiducial. So the purpose of using this colorful Vifuria marker here is to get the anchor point. So this was one of the technical challenges for our work, like getting this precise anchor point. So that's why we have used um, two different kinds of tracking mode here, the V Fourier tracking mode and the HoloLens tracking. So um, in the beginning of the experiment, when the V Fourier tracking mode is on, uh, virtual cube is rendered at the center of this V Fourier marker. So we used the position of the, uh, the position of the cube and then the experiment switches to the HoloLens tracking mode. And that virtual cube is placed in different positions of the grid. So in the second picture, you can see that um, there is a white cube that is placed in a position in this vertical plane. So the participant needs to verbalize the center of this cube location to the uh, experimenter. Suppose for the vertical plane, the participant can say that uh, the X value for, the, for this cube center is like 10.2 and the Y value is like 3.6 and same for the horizontal plane, but the, but the participant is to verbalize the X and Z coordinate to the experimenter here. So now comes to our secondary task. This is quality rating. So one of the longest standing problem in air is that the virtual object appeared to float above the surface. So for uh, judging the quality of the virtual cube, 
we have included a subjective rating here. So the participant will give a rating to the virtual object in a range of one to four. So if the participant can see that the cube is floating above the surface in horizontal plane or it is in front of the vertical plane, it is rating one. Or if the cube is rating on the surface, it is rating two. If the cube is penetrating, it is rating three. And the, if the cube is behind the surface in vertical plane, or it is below the surface in the horizontal plane, that is rating four. So here comes our first experiment. So the purpose of um, our experiment one is evaluating basically two questions. So our first question was evaluating whether the built-in hololens tracking would successfully retain the tracking accuracy after loop closing. So that's why we have included the movement yes and the movement no condition here. So in the movement yes condition, the participant will take a complete turn between each of the trials and in movement no condition, the participant will stand still at the same position. Our second purpose was um, evaluating whether the rendering style of the virtual cube would affect the accuracy of the perceived location. So that's why we have introduced two different cube designs here. The first one is the solid cube, that is a white cube. And the second one is the green cube with the red bisecting line on it. And we are using um, Hololens 1 display here. We named that as display 1. And in the vertical plane, here is the cube rendered. Here is the x axis and the y axis. And for horizontal plane, here we consider the x axis and the z axis. So here comes our, the results from our experiment one. So there were total 24 participants and it was designed, it was a between subject design. So that means uh, 12 participants saw the solid cube and the 12 participants saw the mark cube. So in the graph here, the X exit shows the left right error and the Y exit shows the up down error for the vertical plane. And, it, and um, the Y exit shows the front back error for the horizontal plane. So here, these circles show the error and colors are, diff uh, colors are different for the movement. So from the result, we can see that the, the vertical plane, there is no left-right bias, but there is an upward bias. But for the horizontal plane, we can see there is a rightward bias and also there is a frontward bias. So that means underestimation. So we also found that there was no difference in the cube design and also there is no effect of the movement. So that means the built-in hollowness tracking is able to successfully close the loops. So here comes our another result from the quality rating. In the first graph, the x-axis shows the cube style and the solid and marked cube, and the y-axis just shows the count. Here we can see that the participants mostly rated the on the surface than the above rating. And there is also penetrating and below that due to the, that was very minimal. And movement had no effect and also the solid cube style was then most likely than the marked one. And from this, from the second gra graph, this density graph shows that this dot is the mean value and the straight line is the median value. Here, x exit shows the quality that is above and on. Uh, and we just com uh, considered here above and on because these two were mostly rated by the participants. And y exit shows the error. For vertical plane, it is y error. And for horizontal plane, it is z error. So we can say that for the vertical plane, the density that is associated with the above rating is in plus y direction than the on rating. And for horizontal plane, it is, this, it is in minus z direction. So the logistic regression indicates that the uh, error that uh, error significantly predicted the probability of above rating than the on rating here. And it is also consistent with the hypothesis that the upward bias in the vertical plane and the Front, uh, and the front back bias in the horizontal plane was due to the, because uh, the virtual object appeared to float above the surface. So here comes our experiment two. So we considered that as we found rightward bias in our experiment one, and there was also an estimation, this could be because of a display show. So the purpose of experiment two was uh, determining if the rightward bias in the horizontal plane was due to any issues related to uh, display one. So we used uh, an identical HoloLens one display here, and we named that as display two. So from the, re uh, from the result, error, from the result of the error graph, we can see that for the vertical plane, the judgments were generally accurate, comparing the uh, uh, dimension of the grid and the cube, 
but for the horizontal plane, it shows the right hand bias. And another interesting finding is that for the display one, it showed a forward bias. So we can say that the display one showed more underestimation bias than our, the display two, and also that the display two was more accurate in the depth dimension. And here comes the uh, rating graph. Here um, uh, in the first graph, we can see that for the vertical plane, uh, he was mostly rated on the surface and it is mostly double than the above surface rating. But for the horizontal plane, the above rating and the on rating uh, counts were quite similar. And for the from the density graph, we can also see that the logistic regression also, signify, also indicates that the error predicted the probability of above rating than the on rating. So it is also consistent with our previous hypothesis that the virtual object appeared to float above the surface. But our experimental results were more precise than we, that we found in our experiment one. So here comes our final discussion. So you can see that for experiment one, we have introduced our movement yes and movement no condition. We found no effect of movement. We used the solid and the mark cube. We found no effect of the cube style also, but we found a record bias here. And for experiment two, we used um, two HoloLens displays, HoloLens one displays, but we found, uh, we also found the record bias here, but our error, uh, our error was minimized here. And it was, and we got the more uh, precise result for our experiment too. But the right word bias was still undiscovered. So based on that, we are considering some of the future works here. So a potential future work would be uh, replicating the similar study using the modern OST displays, such as Hollywood 2 or Mantiply. And also uh, in, um, another potential work would be including the eye dominance because the hypothesis behind that is when the participants of the cube on the horizontal plane, they primarily uh, cite their view on their dominant eye. And for our experiments, most of the participants were right eye dominant. So uh, including a monocular and a binocular condition in a future work and could, less the, could lessen the underestimation bias and could uh, make the result more precise in the future. So here are the references and uh, thanks to NSF for supporting this project, and that's all from my side. Thank you. All right, thanks. So I had a question, and you may have said this because my internet dropped out of the beginning for a bit. So, but um, <clears throat> did you have any people with color blindness in your study? Uh, no, like for the participants, we didn't found any participant that was color blind. Oh yeah, just wondering. Well, they, they didn't report color blindness. We didn't yeah. like test them for that. Okay, gotcha. But we asked yeah. them, you know, we asked them. Oh, right, right, yeah. <clears throat> All right, uh, okay, thanks. So let's move on to the next. We are, is mirror, mirror on my phone, investigating dimensions of Self-face perception induced by augmented reality filters. This is Rebecca Fribo, uh, with who is an associate professor of. Okay, I'm not going to try. To, I didn't ask her how she said the name of her university. I'm not sure how she said the name of her, of her name. Uh, so I'll let her do that. Uh, and her research interests include avatar embodiment and self-perception in virtual and augmented reality. Jen. So hello everyone and thank you for attending this presentation of our paper Mirror Mirror on my phone investigating dimensions of self-face perception induced by augmented reality filters. This work was conducted by Etienne Payard from EMT Atlantic, Rachel McDonnell from T Trinity College Dublin and myself in Trinity College Dublin when conducted this work and now in École Centrale Nantes. But let's dive now into the subject of this paper augmented reality filters. Starting with this question, why exploring augmented reality filters? Well, the main use of AR filters today, or AR, sorry, today for the general public is in applications for smartphones. In particular, social network applications allow the use of many augmented reality filters, modifying users' environments, but also their own image. And these augmented reality filters are increasingly, increasingly and frequently being used and can distort in many ways user facial traits. Yet, 
we still do not know clearly how users perceive their faces augmented by these filters. Face perception has been at the center of a consequent core of research from which studies have highlighted that specific facial features could strongly influence the appeal, intelligence, and personality perception of human faces. For instance, people with wider faces were judged more threatening and more dominant, especially for males. And males with higher face width to height ratio tended to be judged less trustworthy. Studies also explored the perception of virtual faces, showing some discrepancies between the way we perceive human or virtual faces. For instance, narrow faces were perceived more aggressive, more dominant, and less trustworthy. While these studies highlighted valuable insights on the link between facial features and the perception of human faces, they tackled the perception of other people's faces. Yet, self-face perception differs from the perception of other faces as it involves different cognitive processes. Some works explore self-face perception, but mainly focused on the impact of self-face alterations to increase users' self-perception of attractiveness, acuteness, and while looking at pictures. As for the self-face perception through filters, to our knowledge, they remain focused on the impact of filters on consumers' self-concepts and behaviors. We therefore believed that there was a lack of knowledge on the direct perception of the augmented self-face as seen through these types of filters. The main aim of this paper was thus to explore how users perceive appeal, personality, intelligence, and emotion on their face when specific distortions are applied to it through augmented reality filters. To that aim, we conducted a remote experiment that involved 40 participants in which they had to look at themselves through different filters and rate how much they agreed on several items related to face perception. Filters used in the experiment were designed considering literature findings on which facial features were likely to influence specific sp facial traits. The eye size, the eye's interdistance, and the width of the face, and also the orientation of the eyebrows. Each of these filters were changed in two directions. For instance, eye size could be either big or small, and also two levels of intensity. So for instance, very big, big, very small, small. We also added virtual contents to the face instead of distortion, one realistic uh, with the glasses and one non-realistic with whiskers and uh, cat ears. The filters were designed with less lens studio that uh, allowed to adjust the filters to most spaces of uh, morphology. Uh, I won't go into details about that, but you can find uh, the details on the choices of values of deformation uh, in the paper. In terms of apparatus, the experiment applications was developed as a snapshot lens, which uh, is an augmented reality mask that overlay your face with details. Participants had to download Snapchat and create accounts, if not already. And they had to go on, uh, on the experiment web, uh, web page to get the lens. And uh, there was uh, a link to a Google, uh, Google form there as well. They would, on the Google form, sign a consent form and fill in a demographic questionnaire and get the instructions for the experiment. They would then try all the filters and answer questions online. As for the protocol, a user interface on the lens would guide participants through the procedure of the experiment. So for each filter, participants had to look at themselves on screen for seven seconds and then answer a questionnaire online on another device, putting the corresponding code of filter that you can find on, top, on the back of the screen. And between each filter, participants would see themselves without any alteration for three seconds, but also without needing to answer questions on the form after it. The aim was mainly to avoid the effect of transitioning uh, or transition from seeing oneself with one filter to another. And in that spirit, we also randomized the order of filters for each participant. In addition, the first filter participant would always start the experiment with and finish the experiment with uh, was always a neutral filter, which was just the video feedback of uh, themselves with no alteration. Now about the collected data. In this experiment, we were interested in two main things. Firstly, we wish to determine if participants perceive personality, appeal, intelligence, and emotion on their altered face, similarly to people to the way people tend to perceive those traits uh, on other people's face. And secondly, 
we wanted to test if the intensity of the alterations would affect these results on self-recognition. So to that aim, participants answered on seven-point Likert scale to the question, how much do you agree with the following statement, I look, plus an item, uh, which belong to several categories. So for personality, we had trustworthy, dominant, aggressive. For appeal, we, have, we had attractive, cute, and eerie. For intelligence, we had clever, emotion, we had angry and sad. And we also had a control category, beautiful and ugly, uh, to verify that uh, it was always nearly the opposite answer for those two elements and to be sure that participants were not, uh, were not answering randomly. We had many hypotheses based on previous work, so I will just show some examples. So, for instance, we expected uh, wider male faces to be judged uh, less trustworthy. Uh, we also expected faces with high intensity alteration to be rated as less looking like participants to compare to uh, low intensity alterations. In terms of statistical analysis, so we conducted one way ANOVA for each item with filter as a within subject category categorical variable. Upon significance, we conducted pair group analysis using two k-tests, and we reported only the significant differences between two filters impacted the same features. So for instance, between small eyes and big eyes, or between one feature and a normal face with no alteration. So for the dominance, for instance, we found that bigger eyes were perceived less dominant than smaller eyes, which validated the one of our hypotheses. We also computed a correlation matrix between our items, highlighting strong correlations between resemblance and many happy traits, suggesting that users are disturbed by the differences between their modified face and the normal face, which reduces their perceived appeal. I won't go into the detail of all the results because I don't have uh, the time for that, but the important points are that there is a similarity in the way we perceive some facial traits in others and in our own face. And also, even small distortions of the face impacted participants' self-recognition. So humans seem to be highly attentive to faces and to their own image in particular. Eye size was the most important parameter impacting the self-perceived aggressiveness, anger, cuteness, and dominance of users. Eyebrows orientations were also very effective to convey emotions as sadness and anger. And overall, facial traits perceptions on self-face with alteration was highly influenced by user self-face recognition. We also had several limitations uh, and future work points uh, regarding these studies. So the first thing is that participants mainly uh, self-reported as white and Caucasian. So it would be really interesting and important in uh, future works to include other ethnicities in, uh, in uh, such studies. Participants are so usually found uh, in themselves less resemblance when using uh, augmented reality filter. And uh, one solution that we could try to pave this issue would be to try to improve a sense of enfacement towards this uh, altered face. Uh, and this could be done using, for instance, uh, feedback, tactile feedback, uh, if we make them touch their face. Oops, sorry. Um, another point is that we focused here on the perception only of one own modified face, which was uh, the point of the study. But it would be interesting to see if the filters we design uh, uh, like give similar results on other people's face to kind of uh, also have a baseline of uh, those filters on other people's face. Uh, and finally, in the present study, we were focused on how participants rated how they looked like. The word was important. We only ask how like, I look like and not I feel uh, like. And in future work, we envision investigating how participants feel and behave when they use this kind of filters. So to conclude, it is commonly said that today's communication is happening more and more through screens, increasing greatly our exposure to video feedback of ourselves. And this is even more true in the recent times of the pandemic. In this context, and considering the important use uh, of uh, filters in this communication meet, it is important, important to evaluate the impact of such distorted representation of ourselves. And we believe that the results of the present study lay the first foundations for research to evaluate psychological impacts of augmented reality filters on self perception. So thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thanks. So it looks like 
Uh, there's one question in the Discord from uh, Anne Helena Olivia. Um, did you give instructions to the participants about their facial expressions during the experiment? Yes, that's a, a very good question because it's not something I, yeah, I precise in the presentation. So we asked people to stay neutral uh, when they looked at themselves. And of course, uh, while we were uh, doing this remotely, so we were not controlling that, it's uh, something we are not sure of, and I think it maybe was difficult uh, for the participant to to stay neutral. But uh, it was really uh, like some some rules that we would like we would uh, ask them to stay neutral while looking uh, at themselves because of course that, that would otherwise bias the, the effect, especially uh, the one on the eyebrows that would uh, change the expression. If you smile, then it also make a, make a difference. So thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, the next one. Next paper is Crowd XR Pitfalls and Potentials of Experiments with Remote Participants. This is going to be presented by Alexander Klippel, as the chair professor of the Laboratory of Geoinformation Science and Remote Sensing at uh, Wageningen University and Research. His research interests include 3D modeling, virtual augmented reality, crowdsourcing, landscape concepts, and human concepts. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Um, unfortunately, I don't have pictures of all my co-authors, uh, which uh, I made a point uh, to include next time. Um, I also just wanted to say quickly that at some point we all had been at uh, Penn State <laughs> and now we are wonderfully distributed across the entire world, so to speak. Um, yeah, thank you uh, again for uh, having me. Uh, just a couple. Oops. Uh, yeah, uh, quick comments. So virtual environments, that's um, what we know, what we are all here, uh, really have seen uh, a tremendous uh, adaptation in the general public, especially since uh, 2016 or 2014. Um, uh, we made huge progress uh, in sort of the industry of immersive technologies, such as head mounted displays. Uh, which can, as we all know, uh, immerse users uh, fully to give them the same agency as we experience in the physical world. Um, what we uh, also see is that there's a, a ever growing number of uh, people um, using uh, immersive technologies uh, from different uh, domains and also hopefully uh, more and more uh, diverse uh, demographic uh, groups. Uh, from our perspective, particular sort of human behavior researcher uh, can benefit from VR headsets uh, as they are able to mimic as well as control conditions uh, and thereby allowing uh, experiments uh, at scale. Um, what we um, have seen, though, is that despite the promise of head-mounted displays, uh, the use of your headset um, and sort of adaptation is still somewhat somewhat limited uh, in terms of the actually studies done. And uh, so, nearly all VR studies are exclusively or almost exclusively conducted in lab spaces. Uh, these studies, uh, as we all know, often use homogeneous populations of undergraduate students. Uh, and therefore have uh, very limited generalizability, at least for some people of some of the findings. Um, research and education activities additionally uh, have been painfully, as we also experience it now, uh, disrupted by COVID-19. Uh, so where we then had to even shut down the in-lab experiences uh, to adhere to social distancing constraints. Uh, what we have seen though from other uh, fields is um, that uh, so this uh, collaborative web-based approaches uh, to crowdsourcing uh, have been utilized for uh, data collection for quite some time and very successfully though. Uh, so key features of crowdsourcing are participants are usually paid, uh, not much though, uh, and they can be recruited from any geographic location ideally um, and through a range of media including uh, more commercial platforms uh, such as Amazon Mechanical uh, Turk, but also by sending out uh, email uh, emails uh, over commute or over uh, sites and lists such as Reddit or Facebook. Um, social researchers have found that crowdsourcing uh, data collection through these online media uh, can greatly uh, greatly extend and diversify the participant pool. 
Uh, and uh, now with uh, the uh, uh, increasing adaptation of uh, VR and immersive technologies uh, into mainstream, uh, we can think about how do we actually can, or how can we conduct studies uh, in uh, sort of this world of potential crowd XR. So essentially the Amazon Mechanical Turk <laughs> for uh, virtual reality uh, research. Uh, so the study that we did had essentially two objectives. One was to look into the feasibility um, of um, using crowd uh, crowd VR, um, crowd XR as, a, as an approach and look into uh, the validity of the data uh, that we ran. Uh, and then also a second one, uh, and that's uh, actually related to part of the research that we're doing on spatial cognition. So um, uh, what we see here is that uh, we have um, the ability uh, to position users uh, in a virtual environment in very different locations. Uh, and while we find that uh, a lot of things have um, uh, received uh, attention uh, in, uh, in VR, uh, we have actually not seen many studies that look into the location that we can place uh, users in. Um, so that's then essentially the second objective that we had. Uh, so uh, look at to the impact of a user's location uh, within a virtual environment on uh, whether or not it improves uh, spatial memory uh, performance. Uh, so for the uh, in lab, um, well, so the in lab and out lab uh, participants uh, were uh, obviously recruited from uh, different sources. Uh, for the lab study, students were recruited from a university participant pool. Um, participants signed up online and visited our lab to participate in a one-on-one -on -one session. Uh, for the out of lab study, participants were recruited through various online sources, uh, including mailing lists. Um, and uh, crowdsourcing platforms such as Mechanical Turk uh, and Prolific. Uh, in total, we had uh, 22 undergraduate students participating in the lab study and 42 people participated in the remote study. Um, small difference also in the um, equipment. Um, so the VR study, uh, which uh, started before uh, COVID-19, uh, used an HTC Vive Pro. Uh, to run the virtual experience um, and um, uh, the uh, in lab, uh, the out of lab studies uh, targeted uh, the Oculus uh, Quest as well as Oculus Quest uh, to uh, using an experimental application uh, designed with the Oculus SDK. Um, the environments were pretty simple so that we did not um, think that the different kinds of equipment. Uh, would make a huge, uh, huge difference. Uh, the procedure, so we had a, a pre-questionnaire uh, in which we asked participants to report age, gender, uh, as well as other characteristics that uh, potentially can influence uh, their uh, learning performance. Um, we then had a, um, a graph learning uh, and memorization um, uh, experience. Uh, and then uh, a post uh, a post test. Uh, the virtual environments, um, as I said, they were uh, kept pretty simple, uh, as the focus was largely on the location and not on, uh, for example, uh, design or uh, visual fidelity. Uh, so the visual experience in our uh, experiments um, used uh, data visualization, uh, which could be characterized as a classic scatter plot uh, for the participants in. The fully aligned version uh, on the left, uh, the participants were uh, located at the origin of the uh, scatter plot, which means that uh, their egocentric embodied reference frame, so front, back, left, right, up and down, uh, perfectly aligned with the uh, axes of the reference system. In the um, partially aligned system, the user was taken outside uh, the cube outside the scatter plot, uh, which then had the effect that only parts of the uh, reference frames uh, of the user, as well as the scatter plot itself, would be uh, would be perfectly aligned. 
Uh, our hypothesis was uh, that, uh, or the, the hypothesis that we tested using, or the, this hypothesis that the fully aligned one um, was uh, superior to the uh, only partially aligned one, uh, was tested using a, a VR memorization task. Uh, so participants first were given two minutes to memorize the locations and names of uh, the data entities in the graphs. Uh, and then next, uh, the entities were shown to them uh, without labels and participants were asked to use a laser pointer emitted from the hand controller to select the correct entity based on uh, their memory. Uh, and the participants went through it until they were able to uh, reproduce uh, the correct uh, order and the correct uh, names uh, at least twice. Uh, the next uh, participants uh, removed the VR headset and then uh, completed an uh, online questionnaire uh, in which they had to answer questions about the relative distances about the uh, entities and the data entities that they just learned. So the question focused on the memory of the uh, distance of the value distance between the data entities in order to examine to what extent the experience enables a complete mental mapping of the 3D uh, data graph. The demographic comparison uh, for these two conditions indicate that out of lab participants were uh, older and included more males than in the in lab participants. Uh, out of lab participants also reported higher video game familiarity, which is uh, not surprising, as well as VR familiarity. Um, but also, they reported a higher sense of uh, direction uh, than the in lab participants. Uh, given the strong difference between in-lab and out-of-lab samples in demographic profiles and characteristics, um, uh, researchers collecting data from, so as one lesson, research collecting data from remote headset owners should be cautious about treating their data as equivalent to that of laboratory settings. But that's a matter of discussion. Uh, regarding the memorization performance, uh, participants in the out-of-lab study uh, showed actually faster learning times as well as fewer errors that they made and also fewer attempts uh, than their in-lab uh, counterparts. Uh, these results again raise questions about the generalizability of uh, VR memorization tasks. Uh, it should also be noted that the in-lab uh, participants had significantly larger variances uh, in these performance measures than uh, the out of lab participants. So the data collected outside the laboratory uh, seems to have a higher measurement reliability. We also had a slightly higher um, uh, sample size uh, than the data collected in the laboratory setting. Uh, regarding the distance recall uh, or distance recall performance, the out of lab, partic out of lab participants uh, performed similarly uh, to participants from the uh, in lab uh, participant pool. So this indicates that the results of the distance recall task uh, could be understood as being generalizable across different populations. Uh, however, we had hypothesized that there should be an improved memorization and learning for individuals locating at the origin within the 3D graph. Uh, this is something that uh, we did not find. So the participants in the fully aligned as well as in the partially aligned condition uh, did not differ in performance of the VR memorization, uh, in, uh, in the VR memorization or in the distance uh, recall task. Uh, overall, the full alignment of virtual information with the human body in this case, at least, uh, did not help participants learn and memorize the spatial layout of the data represented. Uh, so to conclude, uh, so the recent emergence of low-cost standalone VR headsets such as Oculus Quest, and then the updated version now, uh, the Quest 2, um, have become uh, very prominent. Uh, we have seen that uh, over 2 million Oculus Quest units sold uh, recently, so suggesting that it is indeed uh, sort of a, a time where we can think about having uh, a crowd XR platform similar to uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, but we need to uh, take into account, though, is that uh, we have seen in this research 
Um, well, so what, one thing, sorry, one thing is that uh, the uh, study itself went extremely smoothly. Uh, so it is actually uh, relatively straightforward to run studies with remote uh, XR uh, participants. Uh, the advantages of this approach then lie in that we can quickly build capacity uh, and easily uh, acquire data in uh, large numbers from large uh, participant pools. Um, uh, we compared also a set of the performance measure of learning and memory derived from both in-lab and out-of-lab studies, uh, and the results provide at least initial evidence uh, that the reliability of the data from the out-of-lab sample is as good as or maybe even better than the corresponding in-lab sample. Um, what we also have seen, though, is that and the, uh, the demographics, um, as well as the uh, spatial abilities uh, that we uh, measured are different in those two, um, two uh, populations. Uh, so this study is, uh, I believe, one of the first ones that attempted to validate this remote data acquisition uh, for a spatial cognition uh, uh, research uh, task. Uh, so despite uh, the focus on virtual reality, we believe that our experiences and findings can contribute to the stimulation of crowdsourcing experiments uh, with uh, other XR technologies like augmented or mixed reality. Uh, as the number of headsets and own, headset owners will grow, uh, we believe that crowd XR will eventually play a critical role in evaluating design and practical problems in XR studies. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I had a question. Um, now, in, in, in this study, you, you were able to uh, recruit remote participants that already had their own uh, headsets, correct? Yes. But have you thought about ways of, and I've thought about it, but I haven't come up with any. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, have you thought about ways of including, like, how would you do, I mean, because yeah. how would you get people to, who don't already have a VR headset? I mean, two million people is a lot of people, but you know, there's a lot more people on these, yeah. you know, so and I was just wondering if you had thought a little bit about like the, kind of the next phase of this, where it could potentially be, how do we include people that don't already have VR headsets? Yeah. Yeah. I think there are, there are at least two ways that this could go. So one of course is that at the moment the people who have VR headset are gamers and VR enthusiasts who really uh, so like, okay, I pay 400 bucks and I get a, get a headset. I think that, that that though eventually will change a little bit more and the, that um, it's not just the, as we see that the audience becomes wider, that we eventually will have a bit more saturation in other, in other uh, population groups as well. So the, I think that's a good thing. Uh, and then people might really uh, do this for a living, right? So like, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the M-Turkers also some make a living with this. So that might be one, one thing. Uh, and yes, we did explore other options. So such as sending headsets uh, to participants, um, which we explored for a small scale study, but only very few participants, um, because that's actually even more expensive. And then you have to make sure that you get it back. Uh, and then one thing that uh, is interesting, uh, which we did for uh, education studies, is that uh, you can set up like central points where people can go to and do an experience. So in this case, for example, library. Uh, so instead of instead of having, um, having your own uh, headset or getting a headset sent, you could be in a public space such as a library and they have basically a set of experiments that they run and then you can basically sign up for one and, and participate that way. So yeah, so we discussed a bunch of those things. Some of them seem to be feasible, uh, but yeah, hopefully with the accessibility being improved over time even more, uh, it will become really a, a valid way of thinking about running large scale studies uh, efficiently uh, for people uh, inside and outside sort of uh, the academic realm that offers participants pool at large. So. All right, thanks. Okay, I got a text from Greg Welch. <laughs> it says, huh. hey, yeah. tell him and others to attend our Vera discussion session tomorrow, which is probably relevant to this. <laughs> All right. Yes. Let's let's move on to the our last paper in our session. Uh, it's called Scene AR 
Scene-based micro-narratives for sharing and remixing in augmented reality this is presented by Meng Yu Chen, who is a PhD student in the media arts and technology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And his research focuses on immersive storytelling, virtual reality, and computational tools for artists. Um, yes, yeah, thank you, John, for, intro for the introduction. Uh, seems like I cannot share my screen while some other uh, screen is being shared. Okay, thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. And, uh, okay, so let me start. So uh, my name is Menyu Chen, and uh, I'm going to present uh, our new work, Sing AR. This work was done in collaboration with Andres from SNAP Research at the Perceptual Engineering Lab at UCSD, advised by Professor Misha Shura. Sing AR is a form of a micro uh, storytelling in AR, and the stories can be viewed, shared, and remixed in AR. Um, here's a greetings from all the authors. Um, so short form digital storytelling has become a popular medium for millions of people to express themselves. Every day, people tell their stories through not only pictures and text, but also sound and 2D video. Our work expands this list of storytelling media by enabling the creation and consumption of micro narratives in 3D. Um, CR is a smartphone application that allows anyone to easily create, share, and share short stories in AR. Um, the stories are composed of sequences of AR scenes, almost like an AR comic strip. The generated story and scenes can be viewed by placing them in any physical environment. The stories can be shared with friends and families and anyone can remix and reshare them. The figure here shows an example design of a micro story told in three scenes where the user can create and view each scene on surfaces in their environment as a sequential 3D comic, like a story made of three panels of 3D objects and dialogue balloons. Um, some of the AR storytelling apps out there are Lens Studio by Snapchat, um, Apple Reality Composer, and Adobe Aero, uh, but none of them allow you to tell a multi-scene story uh, or share or, and view it in AR and remix it. They simply allow sharing an image or a video of the AR content created by the user. So we provide a full table of comparison with prior work in our paper. Uh, if you're interested, please check out. Uh, we built Scene AR in Unity with AR Core. Uh, so to tell, uh, to create a story, the user uh, scans their uh, physical environment, looking for planar surfaces uh, where they can place the story elements. The story is created scene by scene, where each scene is composed of 3D objects and dialogues. Our system provides access to over a thousand of 3D models to make it easy for the user to create a story quickly and easily. Um, here we see the main interface and steps involved in creating and sharing a story. From left to right, the user first searches for a 3D object. They can use text search or voice search. Um, the search results are presented at, at the bottom of the screen from which they can pick the model or models they would like to place in their scene. There's no limit to the number of models a user can add to one scene, but after a few of this, the AR view will start to get crowded. Um, once the 3D objects are placed in the scene, the user can change their pose and scale and add dialogue balloons to them, just like creating a, a comic scene, but it's in AR directly. The user can repeat adding or editing the 3D objects and dialogues to compose a full story. Once the story is made, the user can publish it to the cloud repository to make it public. Then other people can find it and view the AR story in their own physical environment. Um, this is a system pipeline that shows the mechanism behind the AR scene creation process. The user inputs a command sentence by either speech or text. Then the sentence will be parsed to search through the 3D data, 3D object data sets and return a list of matching results via cloud-based 3D asset API. Here we use Google Party, um, but we also support the Sketchfab and other kind of 3D data sets. Um, then the user can make a selection uh, and place the selected 3D object into the AR scene and add dialogue bubble to it. User can add multiple objects and scenes to make up the entire story. After the creation is done, the user can publish the story to the cloud repository, which can be accessed by others using the same app. 
uh, Remix is done in the same way where user can load a story and start editing it on it immediately as a multi-scene AR story so that people don't need to start everything from scratch. For more details regarding our system, please check out our paper. Um, so we evaluated Scene AR in a three-day field study with 18 participants. We asked the participants to use Scene AR with a task requirement to create at least nine stories over the three days. Our data collection was made through custom questionnaires, recordings of uh, interviews, and phone screen recordings during app usage sessions. The interview was conducted, conducted in a semi-structured format over a Zoom video conferencing system. Um, from 18 uh, participants, we were able to get a total of uh, 194 stories, more than our required numbers. Within these stories, about 25% were remixed stories, and of the original stories, 26% had one scene, 32% had two scenes, and 42 had three or more scenes. Average app usage time over the three days were 67 minutes with a minimum at about 30 minutes and a maximum of over three hours. So from here, we've got a quite diverse AR story data sets that we can do further analysis on. Uh, from the questionnaires, we found most of the participants thought our app was easy to use, that we have a positive response medium of three and a medium absolute deviation of one. Participants also agreed that they were likely to share their creations with others by a medium of six and medium absolute deviation of zero. <coughs> As our goal of the study is to, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> is to identify and quantify thing AR usage, we semantically coded the interview data to determine characteristics and functionalities. We employed an inductive semantic analysis approach and we had two researchers independently review the screen recordings and the text transcripts of the interviews. Now, each created their own codes. After careful discussion with reference to screen recordings during the app usage sessions and questionnaire uh, feedback, we reached an agreement on the themes. Uh, it helps us to identify three overarching themes on creativity, spatial interaction, and remixing. Um, now, now let's transit to the inductive themes. The first theme is diversity in creativity. This theme describes how participants were able to create stories from different sources by using different narratives techniques. A large number of stories created by participants depict moments from life, which covers topics such as home relations, uh, recreation, politics, games, and nature. They also enjoyed recreating stories from other media like movies and storybooks. While they are creating, they are often inspired by the visual search results they got and use the visual features of these 3D objects to compose the stories. For example, some user initially searched for a mouse, but the search results also returned uh, a Pikachu from Pokemon. Um, so they decided to create, continue the story with the, uh, the Pokemon uh, focus instead of their or original idea of uh, using an animal. We also observed technique transfer from some participants that they use film-like framing methods to create an AR scene. Um, the image on the left uh, is a story depicting a conversation about the international student deport order during COVID-19 pandemic. It is highly associated with the current uh, social political environment. On the right is the recreation of the hare and the tortoise story, which is probably well known to everyone. Um, the second theme is spatial creation and viewing. Our users specifically enjoyed the simplicity and speed of the scene creation process. We received feedback regarding participants' experience with authoring in 3D that they felt like this additional dimension of 3D enabled new possibilities for them to tell the story. Also, the ability to change perspectives and having realistic life-size scales in AR have pro provided them a, a new mental model for thinking about stories. On the other hand, participants created their stories in different settings and various physical environments. They also used the physical objects in their AR stories that blended the real and the virtual elements. The image on the left is a story depicting two penguins debating who jumps first while standing on the edge of a bathtub with the water running. On the right is a recreation of the Super Mario uh, video game scene with the Princess Peach hidden behind a physical toy castle and the virtual Bowser defending it. 
The last theme is about sharing, remixing, and collaborating. Our participants enjoyed creating and sharing stories, and they reported that they would like to share the created stories with their friends and also include avatars that look like their friends into the stories. Our participants also particularly enjoy the feature of remixing, and they created stories specifically for others to remix. During the interview, they noted that the ability to remix made creating stories much easier, as coming up with creative ideas were one of the hardest part for some participants. Viewing and remixing other stories make it much easier for them to create compared to making up a whole story just from scratch. We also observed that remixing afforded a novel form of back and forth communication between participants, even though they do not know each other. It helps them to understand what other people think about, think about their story or how other people interpret their stories. The image on the left shows an original story that has a happy ending, which um, the main character, a knight, came back to his castle after a long journey. On the right is a remix story created by another participant that extends this original ending by a twist that the devil enemy actually has already taken over his home and was welcoming his coming back. Based on our observations, we derived the six strategies for future AR storytelling app design. One of the biggest challenges in sharing AR stories is that the creator's physical environment is likely to differ from the consumers. This can create a disconnection between virtual objects and physical surfaces. One way to mitigate this problem is to guide the story consumer to arrange their physical environments and an instruction of how to place the stories to best match the creator's intent. Provide a snapshot or even a scan of the desired place can, enjoy, uh, can help the consumer to enjoy the story. We also found that uh, spatial navigation can impact the viewing experience. The, in some scenarios, viewers of the story may lose their senses of the direction due to accidental camera movements or if the, the scene is out of the camera's viewport. It is recommended that designers can provide directional arrows that point the viewer toward the center of the scene. Camera clutter can be another issue when there are too many virtual objects that it becomes harder and harder to interact with them. This can be mitigated by exploring different narrative structures using timed objects, animations, or playing to playing movement. We also found that the support for contextual constraints can be useful as many AR stories that have physical dependencies need to be viewed with the same or similar context in 3D. Providing a description of the type of reality the story is augmenting um, is necessary unless we are able to create and share the 3D context directly with each AR narrative. During our study, we also recognized that people have had issues detecting surfaces due to poor lighting, clutter, or surface textures. Having newer devices with better sensors can definitely help. And we can also try saving or caching the story content to prevent the story from disappearing, disappearing from the surface detect when the surface detection fails. The last is the offer, uh, to offer help with uh, uh, writer's block. Creating stories from scratch can always be challenging, uh, especially for non uh, for non professional uh, storytellers. Allowing people to remix other people's stories, as we did, can be useful to scaffold new stories. Offering suggestions or templates based on the user's location or physical environment can also be very useful. Um, this is all we have for our presentation. We are, we are very excited about what people can do with AR as a new kind of storytelling medium. And uh, from our user study, we can see a lot of interesting happenings that come out of our remixable and shareable AR comic style uh, stories. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, for more details, please check out our paper. Thanks. So uh, I've got one question. Um, now, uh, could your can your system currently uh, like uh, allow multiple distributed users? So like you got one person in one place and one person in another place. Just out of curiosity. Um, currently, we are we uh, share all the stories um, in the cloud. I, we don't have a co-located like a collaborative storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, we are more focused on the shareable and remixable parts while okay. the, all the users are re located remotely. Yeah. Cool. And th this is our, how our user study was done. All, all the users were stay at home and they do use our app in their own kind of space. Gotcha.
Okay, so um, I want to remind everybody that uh, this is, we're pretty much at the end of the session now. Um, there is going to be a post session discussion with the authors in the Gather Town room uh, in the QA track B. There are a couple of questions that are still on, uh, that, that popped up as we were going through different pa papers and stuff. So I would, I would, Ask that on, on Discord and uh, um, I think there was one on on Zoom as well. So go if if you can go and check those out, answer those questions, and maybe meet up with those people uh, in the post session discussion. I think you froze again. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. maybe I, I will uh, jump in so thanks a lot uh, for all the speakers for this very interesting and uh, original work uh, really cool work so I think we can move to gather town and then uh, have so where, where, one to one. what part of gather town That's, uh... you should go in a uh, track uh, B and track. then uh, each uh, Speaker, so first speaker should be in room one, second speaker should be in room uh, two. Two, okay, yeah. nice. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone, and thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. See ya. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, thanks, uh, everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trying to figure out the gather town. Yeah. How to find B. Let's see. I wish there was like an overview. See, yeah. I don't, maybe there is. Q&A rooms. Sounds useful. Yeah, so see you there. OK, yes. I'll try to find it. Okay, Q and A rooms. This way. Thank you. 